All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know that some people are still uh, entering the room, but in the interest of time, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, special installation or installment of our Florida Talks at Home, Let's Talk About Water series. Uh, my name is Keith Simmons. I'm the Communications Director at Florida Humanities. And tonight we have Rick Kilby, who is the author of Florida's Healing Waters. And he's going to talk to us about uh, mineral springs and the tourism that surrounded uh, mineral springs here in Florida during the Gilded Age. So I'm just gonna read a little bit of an introduction. I'm going to introduce Rick and then I'm gonna turn the program over to him. Uh, so just a couple things that I want to mention before we get started with this evening's program. Uh, a reminder that this is part of a week-long series that Florida Humanities is hosting that focuses on various aspects of water. And this is leading up to the launch of Waterways. This is a museum on Main Street exhibition that is done by the Smithsonian Institution. And the Smithsonian's Museum on Main Street program brings traveling exhibitions to small towns across the country. So we're proud to be able to bring Waterways back to Florida. Uh, with its impassioned focus on local history, education, and community redevelopment, Museum on Main Street is truly one of the Smithsonian's most inspirational and enduring outreach programs. The Waterways exhibition in particular explores the endless motion of the water cycle, from water's effect on landscape, settlement, and migration, to its impact on culture and spirituality. The tour again launches on Saturday, June 26th, at the Citrus County Historical Society in Inverness. And the tour is going to go from uh, June of 2021 until September of 2022. Uh, to see the full schedule and for more information on waterways, visit floridahumanities.org slash moms. We're grateful to Pallet One and to the law firm of Han, Lozier, and Part for their generous support of the statewide exhibition. And again, don't forget that you can see more about moms-related programs and other programs sponsored by Florida Humanities by visiting our website, floridahumanities.org slash events. At the end of tonight's presentation, you will receive a short feedback survey. We'd appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to fill it out for us. Let us know how we did, ways that we can improve next time, and any potential topics that you might be curious about seeing in the future. And if you have any questions for tonight's program, you can type them in using the chat function of Zoom or to use the Q&A function, and we'll do our best to work as many questions as possible uh, during the Q&A period um, following Rick's presentation. By the way, before I introduce Rick, I wanted to mention that your support is essential to helping to sustain these programs. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, we ask that you consider visiting floridahumanities.org support to contribute to our organization. Your contributions continue to make these programs a possibility. And so again, tonight we welcome Rick Kilby. He's a graphic designer by training and a longtime Florida resident who has fallen in love with our state. His first book, Finding the Fountain of Youth, is about Ponce de Leon and Florida's magical waters. That research led to his second book, Florida's Healing Waters, Gilded Age Mineral Springs, Seaside Resorts, and Health Spas. And with that, we'd like to welcome Rick Kilby. Thank you. It, it's, it's a real honor. I'm a big fan of Florida Humanities. And I have seen the Waterways exhibit. I was involved with uh, when it was in High Springs in 2016. I actually designed part of the exhibit that was uh, the local component. And it's very, very powerful. And I urge you to go see it. For over 150 years, people have been coming to Florida to bask in its warm sunshine and bathe in its healing waters. This evening, I'll give you a brief look into this important era in Florida's history that helped launch the state's early tourism industry. Taking the waters, the process of soaking and drinking mineral water was an important ritual, but ultimately, Florida's water became such a well-known commodity, you could even call it a brand, The bathing in seawater and tap water was believed to be helpful as well. Years ago, when I started writing this book, there's no way that I could have predicted it would have been published during a global pandemic. I think if we've learned anything recently, it's how important personal health is and what steps we will take to preserve our health. As Florida started to develop as a destination for visitors in the 19th century, the search for health was one of the main reasons why the state grew so rapidly. Writer and poet Ralph Waldo Emerson came to Florida in 1827. 
only six years after Florida joined the United States as a territory. And if you don't know it, they joined the United States as a territory in 1821. So actually July is the 200th anniversary of that date. Although it'd be another seven years before St. Augustine had its first hotel even, Emerson, Emerson ventured down to the ancient city in search of relief from consumption. The writer rested, wrote sermons, wrote poetry, and he overheard a slave auction while he was at a prayer meeting. While he complained of being bored at times, he left after a few months with improved health and would live until the ripe age of 79. But that was not the case for many consumptives. At the beginning of the 19th century, consumption, what we call today tuberculosis, had killed one in seven of all people that had ever lived. It was called consumption because the illness led to a general wasting away of the victim. The disease spread more rapidly as more people moved into cities during the Industrial Revolution. By 1851, halfway through the 19th century, one in four deaths in Europe and America was caused by tuberculosis. It was a scourge. And you can see, this is one of my favorite images because it shows how much the disease was feared. Medical advice at the time maintained that fresh air and outdoor activity could offer a reprieve from the disease nicknamed the White Death. As Northern cities suffered from polluted air and water, those with the means fled to the mountains, beaches, and mineral springs to partake of the salubrious air. Florida's climate was very attractive to invalids. A a proliferation of Florida guidebooks helped spur the state's tourism boom after the Civil War, and many directly address interests in physical well being and healing, including this one Going South for Winter with Hints for Consumptives, written by Dr. Robert F. Speer in 1873. Native Floridians took full advantage of warm, the warm, healthy climate to lure ailing Northerners to the state during winter. In 1887, William Derrick Kelly documented a humorous exchange with some Florida pioneers. He was walking through a field and he said, how do you manage to eke a living off these paltry crops? And the, the old seller said, we survive on sweet potato and consumptive Yankees. When asked what they had to sell, their response was our atmosphere. This to me is a very essential point, making a buck was part of the dynamic of Florida's early medical tourism. Native Floridians, as well as transplanted entrepreneurs from the North, saw disease and illness as an economic opportunity down South. Of course, in addition to our warm water, Florida is also blessed with another natural asset believed to be health giving for 19th century visitors to the state. And that is our abundance of freshwater springs. We have roughly about a thousand. But I document about two dozen that savvy business people turned into health spas. They hope to entice consumptives, invalids with other illnesses, and the social elite familiar with the cultured watering places of Europe to visit their establishments. And this is Green Cove Springs in its heyday. And you can see the bathers there. From the ancient Greeks and Romans to Americans during the Victorian era, the use of water for healing has been a consistent practice throughout human history in cultures across the globe. The mineral springs in Bath, England have been used for healing since the Romans dedicated a temple to a goddess named Minerva Sulis. They were also very popular during Victorian times and they are still used for bathing, although in a new facility today. I visited and um, it's an amazing, amazing place. The European bathing tradition almost died out during the Dark Ages, but after the Renaissance, a new spa culture developed at watering places throughout the Europe and new rituals and customs emerged for wealthy society. Going to watering places became popular for people of means, not just the unwell. Eventually, these new social bathing customs found their way to North America. To better understand how these places became so popular in Florida, I sought out some of the historic locations out outside the state from which the tradition sprang from. I visited fame watering places such as Saratoga Springs, New York, which is probably the most, gilded, most popular Gilded Age watering place, Hot Springs, Arkansas, 
in this one, Warm Springs, Virginia, where Thomas Jefferson spent nine days taking the waters in the 18th century. Unfortunately, that's my wife there on the left. She worried that the whole place was going to cave in the whole time we were there. And they did close it. And they just recently announced they're going to reconstruction, reconstruct the building because it's an incredible, incredible historical resource. Let's go to Florida. We know that the early civilizations who lived in Florida had a deep spiritual relationship with water. The Tamuquan Indian word for all forms of water was ebi, and the Tamuqua believed springs had sacred powers. It's also said the Seminole believed only the sick should be allowed to reside near a spring, and it's also believed that when warring tribes during the Seminole era came into the presence of a spring, they saw it as an oasis of spring of peace, so all hostilities were, were put aside. When people of European descent started to develop, develop Florida Springs in the mid 1800s, the level of the facilities were very primitive, as can be seen in this image showing the bathing conditions at Green Cove Springs. This would become, Green Cove Springs would become the most popular watering place in the entire state. It's hard to tell though from the early days. After three costly wars with the Seminoles, development of the state began in earnest and was going strong until the outbreak of the Civil War. After the war, Northerners flocked to Florida, arriving most often in Jacksonville, which was dubbed the Italy of America. The city had convenient steamship connections to New York, Charleston, and Savannah. The St. John's River served as Eastern Florida's main transportation conduit throughout the 19th century, and steamboats made the springs along the St. John's easily accessible. During the Civil War, there were Union soldiers in Jacksonville and in Fernandina Beach, and when they went back, they raved about how warm the winters were, and that really helped too. In this image, you can see these travelers coming down in the 19th century. One, it's winter, so they have an abundance of clothes. You know, this is the Victorian era, so they wore an abundance of clothes. But you can see this is not summer that they're visiting in. And you can see that, for the most part, they're affluent. This is one of my favorite pictures because you can see the expressions on the people as they arrive in the Sunshine State. Railroads eventually supplanted steamboats as the primary method of transportation throughout Florida, allowing visitors to travel to Florida faster with a high degree of luxury. That allowed spas at springs in the interior of the state to catch up with those on the St. John's and places like White Sulphur and Swanee Springs would prosper. A great example of a wealthy individual coming to Florida for health reasons can be found in the 1893 letters written by Margaret Kyer to her college age daughter, Cressy, and that's Margaret on the left. Margaret wrote the letters as she traveled through Florida with her husband, Charles Kyer. Charles, or Papa, as Margaret refers to her letter to her husband in the letters, immigrated to the United States at the age of 15 from Germany. By the time he was 22, he had enlisted in the Union Army during the Civil War. When he was discharged, he went into the liquor business. After a few years, he talked a relative from Germany into moving to the U.S. and became the brewmaster for the Chas D. Kyer Brewing Company. And his brewing company was extremely successful, and it was in business until the 1960s. In the 1950s, it even old outsold Yingling, which is a, still a prop, popular brand today. So what you should take away from all this is that Papa Kyer was loaded. He had tons of money. So when the doctor said, go south to Florida, it he had the financial means to do it. He had some kind of pulmonary ailment. The History Museum in Pennsylvania, where he came from, said he they thought he had lung cancer because he was a big smoker. But it could have been consumption or a number of other lung ailments. Kyer's doctor recommended that he visit Florida during the winter of 1893, and they started in Jacksonville. So here's the actual letter that Margaret wrote to their daughter at the start of the Florida trip. And you can see that he was feeling very poorly when they got there. They established Jacksonville as their base. They found a doctor they liked, and they kept going back and forth to Jacksonville to see the doctor. Many of the Northerners, like the Kyers, coming to Jacksonville, they started their Florida trip in Jacksonville. In 1840, I love this stat, Jacksonville only had about 350 year-round wet residents. 
But by the end of the century, around in, you know, the year 1900, they were drawing 70,000 visitors a year. It just exploded with growth. And you can see that in this diagram with all the sailboats and the river boats and the railroad going right through the middle, middle of the city. And initially, a lot of that business was people coming from the north. The next place the Kyer stayed was in St. Augustine, but this was 66 years after Emerson was there and it was a far cry from the city. By then it was a well-established destination for tourists and really not a place for invalids. But the next place they went to was, and they, that was Green Cove Springs. Green Cove Springs, Springs was dubbed the Saratoga of the South, attempting to draw on the reputation of Saratoga Springs, which was the premier watering place for the wealthy elite. So this is one of my favorite images because you can see those northern visitors in their attire, their winter attire. And I, if you note the gentleman in the center right here, he has a huge camera behind him. I think he's taking selfies for Instagram, actually not in the 1870s. But this is a great example of, of people taking the waters or going to a watering place. And this is the spring right back here to the right of the photo. And this uh, picket fence right here is a bathing area. Back then, uh, you bathe segregated by gender. So men and women would not bathe at the same time. So they would have a men's bathing area and a women's bathing area or different times so that uh, two genders would not bathe at the same time. From the 1870s to the 1890s, Green Cove Springs expanded at a meteoric rate as northern visitors flocked to this town with its little third magnitude sulfur springs. So this is the spring right here circled on the left. And you can see how the town just kind of exploded around it. And all the river boats and sailboats here, everyone who went up the St. John's River from Jacksonville had to stop at Green Cove Springs. Also note over here on the right, this is the Magnolia Springs Hotel. It had another spring and it was another spa where people visited. And it would have been the first grand spa that people saw as they went upriver. The premier hotel in Green Cove Springs was the, Cla was the Clarendon Hotel, which you can see there behind these people on the uh, left. This is a stereograph image from George Barker, who was one of the photographers who came to Florida. And stereograph images really helped the state to blossom because they were cheap and people had baskets of stereograph cards in their parlors. And Florida was seen as very exotic. So photographers loved to come here and photograph it. So people like George Barker from Niagara Falls came here and took tons of pictures. And this is the standard pose with the spring in the foreground and the clarinet in the background. On your right is an advertisement for the Clarendon House. And I want you to note the thing I've underlined in red, Green Cove Warm Sulfur Springs. Even though it's 78 degrees, people are coming here in winter. The air temperature is much cooler than the spring. So they were seen as warm springs, which we would never think of that today because we see them as things you jump in in summer, which are freezing cold. But then they were seen as warm springs because it was winter and the air temperature was so much colder. These were people of means, so they needed leisure activities that they could have on a typical vacation. So you had activities such as dancing, concerts, croquet, horse racing, shopping, hunting and fishing. You'd see the guy in the top right fishing and they loved to shoot alligators from the deck of the steamboats to the, to the extent that sometimes there were no alligators left. They shot them left and right. They loved to go on boat tours up the Black Creek and then you can see that one of the touring boats and the postcard on the upper left, you can see that person had wrote, and this is where we get our ice cream. So this was society, people of means coming here as well as invalids. And it's very, very likely that the, the non-invalid people greatly outnumber the actual invalids. One of the things you did when you came to Green Cove Springs is you walked along what was called St. David's Path up to Magnolia Springs. It's a path that went along the river and that's where people did their promenading. Promenading was a 19th century social convention, an opportunity to be seen, especially if you were a single lady by a potential suitor. And so you would promenade up and down. Our friends, the Kyers, uh, let's get back to them. 
they pro or they you know, they were married, so they weren't looking for potential mates, but they did what everyone else was doing. So they walked along St. David's Path up to Magnolia Springs. Unfortunately, Popper Kyer, he, you know, his health was failing. When he got there, they couldn't walk back, so they had to take a boat to get back to Green Cove Springs. And they liked it very much. Kyer, in one of the letters, Margaret Kyer says, oh, Papa loves this place so much, he thinks he'll buy it. And I think she was just joking, but he was pretty well off. As travel patterns and recreational habits changed in the 20th century, the popularity of Green Cove Springs diminished. The Victorian era hotels are now gone, but the still popular spring fed pool at Green Cove Springs is part of a remodeled city park that opened in 2017 for recreational swimming from May through September. That's the spring in the foreground. The water is channeled to the swimming pool behind it. It still seems really cool in summer and it reeks strongly of sulfur because that's what people wanted in the Victorian era. They wanted those sulfur springs because they believed it was good for them. One of the earliest hotels I found that catered to invalids, and this would have been probably one of the last hotels you would find along the St. John's River, was built by Zachary Taylor's cousin Cornelius in Enterprise, Florida on top of a shell mound where the spring run from Green Springs entered Lake Monroe. And you can see one of the enormous shell mounds on Lake Monroe in this picture. Unfortunately, these were all used for road fill and no longer exist. This hotel was built in the 1840s, perhaps the earliest, but it was replaced by an even greater hotel a mile west by a steamboat captain named Jacob West. I'm, I'm sorry, Jacob Brock. And Jacob Brock was built this New England style hotel called the Brock House Hotel. It, they kept expanding it and expanding it. Eventually it had 150 rooms and it opened in 1855. So this is before the Civil War. And it catered mostly to sportsmen who liked to shoot alligators as well as quail and other things. But it also appealed to invalids because it was close to Green Springs that has this incredible jade color. In Enterprise in Sanford across from uh, Enterprise on Lake Monroe was kind of the end of the line for the big river boats. That's where they had to stop. And our friends, the Kyers, probably came through there because we know they traveled to Rockledge on a smaller steamboat. So they probably stopped either at Enterprise or Sanford or maybe both. But the next spring that they went to was Swanee Springs, which is near Live Oak. And it is one of the springs that prospered during the railroad era. It had famous mineral waters and they built this basin around the spring out of rocks to confine the, the mineral waters and to raise the level for swimming. Because again, it's a very small spring. I believe it's a third magnitude. And when I say magnitude, that's how you um, judge the amount of flow that comes out of the spring. The first magnitudes are the biggest ones and third are, are fairly small. So Swanee Sulphur Springs became one of the state's premier destinations for invalids. And what's unique about that place is they, they offered um, accommodations to the guests all year long, not just in the uh, winter, and that it was popular well into the automobile era. The thing about it was, though, unlike Green Cove Springs, where you see a whole town just kind of blew up around it, Swanee Springs was fairly isolated and is kind of a self-included in or a self-reliant um, resort where everything was attached to the resort. And that the hotel is right in the mi middle. And you can see when the Kyers stayed there, they complained that there was not much to do. It rained the first time they were there and they were very religious. They loved, they were Catholics who loved going to mass and there was no church them for them to visit and, and not many other guests. So they, they were not happy, but the water must have worked because it's the one place they went to twice. And in one of the letters, Margaret said, we're back because this is the place where the water worked for Papa. And so it had a powerful effect. Had the Kyers wanted more social activity, all they really had to do was go a few miles down the river or up the river, down the river, to White Sulphur Springs, which was this incredible facility that had many diversions in addition to bathing. Visitors could go to the theater, they could go shopping, they could go bowling, they could be, go skating and hunting and fishing. All that was available at White Sulphur Springs, which like Green Cove Springs had a whole town around it. And you can see how many people are there at this enormous spring house? 
And this was built by a Confederate widow named Minnie Mosher Jackson, whose brother was a physician in the early 1900s. They hired an architectural firm out of Jacksonville and built this imposing structure that had space for concessions, a clinic area, dressing rooms, and an elevator. They sold this spring in 1960, but it continued to operate for several decades. They tore down most of that building in the 1970s, but they kept the base and then they, they restored the top. If you've been to White Springs, you may have seen this. That's where the folk music festival is there. It's still in existence. The spring has, for the most part, dried up. If there's a big water event, sometimes it will flow. Or if the Swanee's high enough, the water will flow through where those rectangles in the back where a gate would have been originally. Back to the Kyers. Sadly, he never found the Fountain of Youth. I believe they were here in Florida for three months, traveling all around the state, visiting those two spas, Swanee Springs and Greenco Springs. Six years after he left Florida, he um, succumbed to his illnesses. But there were many people who did come to Florida on doctor's orders who lived out the rest of their lives here, made significant contributions to the state's developments. A great example is Will Wallace Harney, who came to Orange County and wrote newspaper dispatches to newspapers up north. And he came here um, actually because for his wife's health purposes. This is a map of all the springs uh, that I cover in my book where health spa facilities were there. The ones in orange were the ones that were adjacent to the St. John's River that really developed because of steamboat um, traffic going up and down the river. And so they had a huge advantage. And so, so that's where some of the larger ones like Magnolia Springs and Green Cove Springs were, as well as Wakaiwa and um, some of the other ones were smaller, like Wadesboro and, and Moncrief. And blue are the ones in North Florida that were really reliant on railroad travel. So they developed later, but you again, you had big places like Swanee Springs and White Springs, as well as Dowling Springs. And then the green ones are the springs along the Gulf. And they relied on different forms of transportation and they really varied in size and the time they were developed. I want to talk about two of those, starting with what's now called the Safety Harbor and Resort, because it's one of the few havens of healing and restoration left from what I call Florida's golden age of bathing. It was discovered after the Second Civil War when a guy named Colonel William Bailey Jr. acquired the springs in Safety Harbor, supposedly directed the location of the springs by a sick Seminole prisoner. That's the story. He originally named it after himself. It was called Bailey Springs or Bailey by the Sea. But eventually the settlement there came to be known as Green Springs. And again, it has two different stories. It's either after a paralyzed farmer whose health was restored by the springs or a doctor who worked there named Dr. J.T. Green. And it's not very uncommon for springs to have name changes. You know, a great example is Rainbow Springs was originally called Blue Springs. Um, Green Coast Springs was called White Sulphur Springs. There's another White Sulphur Springs. So the names are constantly changing. A lot of it is to take advantage of the tourist trade. When the community that grew up around the spring was ready for a post office in 1890, it was changed to the name Safety Harbor instead of Green Springs to avoid confusion with Green Cove Springs. The springs themselves, however, were co collectively called Espirito Santo Springs, which means Springs of the Holy Spirit. And you can see this is the early facilities built right over the water. The bathhouse is there. Of course, when you build wooden facilities over water like this, they're very susceptible to hurricanes. And I think a lot of these buildings were lost when a hurricane came through. The facilities were rebuilt, though, around a little bit later by the Espirito Santo Springs Corporation, who at this time owned the springs. They built a hotel and a sanatorium and with a new pavilion improved dressing room. So this was in the 1920s. This is the time of the big Florida land boom and the style of the day is Mediterranean revival. And you can see the new facilities are built in the Mediterranean revival architectural style. Also note behind the buildings, there's a whole lot more land than there used to be because they added fill and extended the, the uh, land behind it. And I love this place. This place still exists as the Safety Harbor Spa and Resort because they have such a great done such a great job of interpreting their history. A lot of the facilities still exist. They even have a hotel room that is decorated as it would have been in the 1920s. It's a great glimpse into what again I call Florida's golden age of bathing. I've only the first picture I showed you actually showed somebody in the water, and that's the only 
photo I've ever been able to find of someone actually bathing at the spring. I think the big thing there was drinking the water. And you can see there was five springs, that three of them were available for, for drinking. And the, the color photo at the top is a modern photo of the same sign that they used to use. And you can see the springs were arranged by the different ailments they supposedly could heal. So number one was for stomach orders and skin or disorders. Um, Number two is for things like arthritis, Bright's disease, kidney stones. Number three, gall and uh, gallbladder and liver disorders, as well as a mild laxative. Then some were just for use for drinking water, just as table water. And I don't know whatever happened to the, the fifth spring. But you can see this sign today. If you go there, it's still, it's still up. Today, the resort is a world-class spa, but it still offers hydrotherapy treatments such as steam rooms, saunas, a ladies' plunge pool, an indoor pool, and whirlpools, as well as an outdoor lap pool using the original water that comes from the spring. And you can see where the water is piped from underground. You really can't see the spring itself, but it's in the beauty salon. So should you go, and I do recommend going because the town of Safety Harbor is one of my favorite places in Florida. Make sure you go to the beauty salon and look through the plexiglass and you can see where the water comes from. The next place I want to talk about really developed in the mid-century. So it's it's a stretch to call it a Gilded Age resort, but it's such a fascinating place that I, I had to include it in my book. People have been visiting warm mineral springs for literally thousands of years. In more recent times, early developers saw the spring's potential, but it wasn't fully developed into a health spa until the middle of the 20th century. There are plans to develop them further. Uh, it's owned by the city of Northport now, and they are going to build a whole lot of great stuff there, including an amphitheater, and really turn it into a, a, a very high-end facility that is accessible to everybody, everyone. One of the most unique thing about this place, though, is that thousands of years ago, when the climate of Florida was much more arid and desert-like, water was a precious commodity. Sinkholes with water at the bottom, like the geological feature that ultimately became more mineral springs, were attracted to both people and animals of the time. So as a result, beneath the surface of the spring, it's, it's really an hourglass-shaped if you were to take a cross section, it's shaped like an hourglass. So in that little narrow part, there's a ledge and they found a remarkable cache of archeological finds from pre prehistoric human remains to bones of mastodons and giant sloths and saber tooth tigers. So from just an archeological perspective, it's very unique. It, in more modern times, it re really came on the radar of people of European descent in the 1870s. It was called Big Salt Spring, and we know ranchers use it. So this is from 1875, a book called Wildlife in Florida. It, this, this was roughly equivalent to when the Clarendon Hotel was in Green Cove Springs. So as you can see, this developed much later. And this, is, <laughs> this is the accommodations at Warm Mineral Springs in the 1870s. In the 20th century, one of the spring's earliest known owners was the wife of a wealthy Philadelphian named George K. Brown. He purchased the property, or she purchased the property, and it was reported it would be developed into a great health resort due to its remarkable medical qualities. But the Browns did very little to develop the site. There was a caretaker on the site for people who did want to bathe in the water, and they did, and they would charge a minimal amount. There's a story that John Ringling, who lived nearby in Sarasota, offered to buy the spring for a quarter of a million dollars, but the Browns refused to sell it because they wanted to develop it into a spa, but they never did. In the mid 20th century, developers bought the property, built more permanent structures, and branded it Warm Mineral Springs, a place where people suffering from different ailments could pay a small fee to bathe. It, was operated, it has operated as a day spa since 1947. But they really saw an opportunity to make more money. They attached themselves to the myth of the Fountain of Youth, like so many springs did. There was a guy in 1943 who actually was one of the owners of the springs who wrote an article that it was the Fountain of Youth and that it was published in Smithsonian. So they always claimed in their advertising to be the real Fountain of Youth. And the fictional connection to the Spanish conquistador became especially useful during the 400th anniversary of European settlement in Florida. The Florida 
quadricentennial took place between 1959 and 1965, dates that marked 400 years since the founding of Pensacola and St. Augustine. And they had these incredible facilities on the left built by an architect named Jack West, who is a member of what's called the Sarasota School of Architecture, which was kind of a mixture of the international style and the climate and landscape of Florida. And um, you've probably heard of uh, Lundy and um, Rudolph and some of the other architects. Jack West built these facilities. The building on the far right that's round was a cyclorama where you could learn about the life of Ponce de Leon. And that hourglass shaped building is kind of an homage to the cross section of the spring. And those buildings have recently been put on the historic register and hopefully those will, will be restored as the city of Northport restores the spring. The sculpture on the right still exists too, although water does not flow from it anymore. Today, Warm Mineral Springs has a devoted following of Eastern Europeans, mostly Russians, who have moved to Florida permanently in order to take the waters every single day. For a while there, they were between vendors and the springs closed and people actually started to pick it because they wanted their fix of the heating waters at the spring. It's a very unique place because the primary language spoken there is Russian. And you can go to Northport and you can find Russian bakeries and restaurants because it's that um, prominent in the fixture of the community there. All right, I'm gonna switch gears here and talk about sea bathing. Sea or surf bathing was the saltwater version of the taking the waters ritual. And for a time, it was a popular method for utilizing Florida's healing waters. Early in the 19th century, the only cities of any size in Florida were Pensacola, St. Augustine, and Key West. All three of them were located on the water, but none of them had major springs. So in the early traveler literature, such as John Lee Williams' Territory of Florida, he talked about salubrious sea breathing and, the, and how the residents would use, go out into the sea as a healthful practice. Eventually, sea or surf bathing would supplant, well, I would, I would, would supplement taking the waters and mineral springs and really help to open up the coves for development. Bathing in seawater for medicinal purposes originated the seaside town of Scarborough on England's northeastern coast when a gentleman named Sir John Floyer published a book on the healthful benefits of seawater around the year 1700. While the sea-loving cultures of the Mediterranean often reveled in recreational pursuits at the beach, then it was a novel idea to enter the sea intentionally in the cold, murky waters of England. But when sea bathing for healthful purposes became the, in the vogue in the 1700s, the coast of Britain all of a sudden was bursting with seaside resorts in places like Brighton, Weymouth, Margate, Blackpool, just to name a few. And so this was considered cold water bathing and spring bathing was considered warm water bathing. And up until this point, it was nobody believed it was healthy, but when, when it caught on, everybody was doing it. And in England, this is the Victorian era and before, you have to remember the modesty that was involved. One of the cooler aspects of the phenomena was bathing machines. And these were big wagons that were pulled into the water by horses or very large men so that women could bathe with a degree of modesty. And they would change into their swimsuits, which covered their bodies from head to foot, while at the same time, the men of the era bathed nude. And then they would have these assistants who would drag them into the water, pull them down, and then bring them back up and pull them down and bring them back up. They weren't doing this for recreation. They were doing it, one, because it was very popular and they believed it was good for them. And eventually this fad caught on in Belgium and France and sea bathing caught on in the United States, but I've yet to find evidence of bathing machines there. But it, it's one of the things that helped the fad gain popularity, uh, the fad of sea bathing. It wasn't until after the Civil War when Northerners started venturing into the state in the large numbers to escape harsh winters that our state's beaches started being seen as an asset. The elegant seaside resorts created along the Atlantic by Henry Flagler helped establish Florida as the American Riviera. Flagler, of course, was John D. Rockefeller's partner in Standard Oil, and he eventually built his railroad all the way from Atlantic, the Atlantic coast from Jacksonville to Key West. Around the turn of the century, 
Palm Beach at Flagler's Resorts was the heyday of Florida sea bathing. And this is a photograph and you can see all the people on the beach and their wonderful Victorian attire. But one of the things that's different from a contemporary beach are the safety lines. And you can see them going right across the top of the picture here. And that is because many of the people at this time still do not know how to swim. Swimming started to gain in popularity about 1850, but until that point, it was seen kind of as a lower class people. So, so people of means did not know how to swim. Around 1900, a lot of people still did not know how to swim. So that's why you see images like the one that says, you know, safety first, bathe within the, the lifelines. And you see images like this, where this lady is holding on with all her might to the safety line. The notion of sea bathing in winter was dangled by Florida's early promoters as the ultimate bomb for Florida's northern winters. The roots of sea bathing, the hypothesis that immersion in cold water had a therapeutic value, was also the source of inspiration for the emergence of hydrotherapy or hydropathy, another use of Florida's healing waters. Belief in the power of warm mineral spring water and later cold seawater was well established. But new thinking advanced the notion that any source of clean cold water had a helpful effect on the body when applied correctly, even if it came just from the tap. In the late 1800s, or in the 1800s, I should say, establishments stressing fresh air, exercise, healthy eating, and bathing in fresh water offered hope for consumptives. The first of these facilities known as sanatoriums or sanitariums in the United States opened in Saranac Lake, New York in the Adirondacks in 1885. Soon American consumptives flocked to similar facilities, usually located in rural settings with fresh air, sunshine and clean water. No sanitarium was better known than the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan. If maybe you've read the book or seen the movie Road to Wellville, which is based on this famed health facility started by this man, John Harvey Kellogg, fascinating individual, very uh, either ahead of his time or wacky. Uh, you could call him both. He, as a young man, he trained in hydropathy and brought the practices for using cold water that he learned at what was called a water cure, which was an establishment for hydropathy to the famed he, Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan. Kellogg expanded the scope of the Battle Creek establishment far beyond that of a typical water cure into an institution where patients would learn to live a healthy lifestyle. His sanitarium offered 200 different types of water treatments, from cold water immersion to hot air vapor baths. In short, hydropathic cures were an essential aspect of every patient's health regimen at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. In 1876, Kellogg also published a book, The Uses of Water in Health and Disease, detailing his hydropathic methods, one of several books he wrote on the healing power of water. That's him with his cockatoo. So like everyone else, he has to come to Florida at some point. He kind of teased different towns around the state to try and get them to outbid each other. But ultimately he settled on Miami Springs. In the midst of the Great Depression, Aviation pioneer Glenn Curtis and uh, his developer partner, James Bright, had established Miami Springs. But then the depression hits, so he has to unload it. So the building on the left that became the sanitarium was originally a hotel. But in 1929, 1930, you know, no one can afford to come to Florida because it's the Great Depression. So legend has it, he sold it to John Harvey Kellogg for a buck. Johnny Harvey Kellogg tells a different, he said a buck wasn't enough, he actually paid 10 bucks for it. But we know the Miami Battle Creek Sanitarium was extremely successful all the way into the 1950s and hydrotherapy was a big part of the, of the regimen. You can see on the right, uh, more modern hydrotherapy, um, uh, I guess, methods. It kind of looks like you're being shot with a hose and you're taking a bath, but that's kind of what they did there. Another place was in Tangerine in Orange County, very near Mount Dora. And it, the sanitarium there was uh, originated by a guy named Benedict Lust, who learned the NEEP system of hydrotherapy in Europe and brought it to America. He, can, he is still considered one of the fathers of naturopathy 
and may have been the person to open the first health food store in the United States. He operated, operated a water cure establishment called Youngborn, which means born young again, just an hour outside of New York City, and later opened a second facility called Casey Sana, which means here is health, in Orange County in Tangerine in the 1913. It catered to visitors from the north who ventured south by train for a whole regimen of health and procedures, including, again, a plethora of hydrotherapy practices and bathing in Lake Ola, as you see there on the left. Sadly, though, in 1943, the sanitarium caught fire. There were several casualties and loosed himself, succumbed to the injuries he suffered in the blaze just a few years later. The popularity of hydrotherapy in the 19th century can also be observed by facilities at resorts such as the Hotel Alcazar in St. Augustine, built by Henry Flagler in 1888. They advertise possessing the only baths in the world open from November to May. The Alcazar, Alcazar's hydrotherapy facilities included a Russian bath, which was a steam room, a Turkish bath, which is a dry heat sauna, and right in between the two was a cold plunge. Between the cold plunge and the Russian bath was a room with a needle shower where 17 separate shower heads could blast streams of water on a patient. Because it was believed that the, the water would loosen stuff up within your body and that was, would be good to, to get toxins out of your system. A sits bath with hot and cold water. And what you see on the right in this image, a new hydrotherapeutic apparatus with a variety of nozzles on top of this marble cabinet for spraying streams of water at different parts of the body. And that is still there because much of the hydrotherapy area, uh, area of the Alcazar Hotel is still on display at the Leitner Hotel in St. Augustine. If you haven't visited, I'm sorry, the Leitner Museum, which was formerly the Alcazar Hotel in St. Augustine, if you haven't visited, check it out because I really love this stuff and it, it's the best example of Gilded Age hydrotherapy equipment in the entire state. Ultimately, the power of the brand of Florida's healing water was so widely known and accepted that water drawn from a well could be promoted as favorable for weight loss and even preventing the common cold. Orange City Mineral Water was said to be the favorite brand of John D. Rockefeller and was shipped around the country in railroad tanker cars. The well from which it was drawn was capped when it was purchased by Orange City, but water pumped from the Florida aquifer is still shipped all over the country today. The brand of Florida's water is still potent. In the 19th century and early 20th century, Florida's artesian springs and salubrious climate were the essential ingredients in promoting the state as a paradise for sickly northerners tired of wicked winters. As Victorians shifted their focus to beachfront resorts and the popularity of the water cure led to inland sanatoriums featuring hydrotherapy, springs were increasingly seen as recreational resources rather than health facilities. But a few vestiges of Florida's golden age of bathing remain. One of the rare spring-based spas that flourished well into the age of the automobile was Taylor County's Hampton Springs near the city of Perry. The drinking water from the spring was sold at pharmacies nationwide. And you can see in the upper left, that's uh, the bathing pool in the bottom right, that's people filling their jugs up with water. There was all this advertising about after you leave, make sure you take the bathing water because it was very popular and believed to be very uh, effective. In the early 2000s, Taylor County opened the former resort property as a county park and swimming in the old pool was very popular. They had to do archeological surveys to even find the remains of the pool. It was completely grown over, the hotel was long gone, but they did and they opened it up as a county park and people loved it. This is an image that photographers John Moran and David Moynihan took where they illuminated this, the, what's left of the spring at night. The water still flows through the pool and eventually goes out the pipe and into a creek behind it. But I love this image because it shows the eternal qualities of the spring. And, and to me, it's a remarkable vestige of the golden age of, of bathing. Well, the county was worried that all the people swimming in the pool would, you know, break their back or crack their head open or something. So they had made this decision to fill in the pool with chunks of concrete. 
and all the people of Taylor County were so upset that they wrote their county commissioners and the county commission reversed their decision and they pulled all the concrete out and opened it up again. They're still not sure as far as I've been able to tell what to do to protect the spring, but it's my belief that both natural and historical treasures from Florida's golden ages should be preserved at all costs. This is what's left of the rock wall at Swanee Springs. The stories that Florida's watering places can tell can help us better understand the state we're in today. Preservation of the vestiges of these places offer wonderful opportunities to understand a tradition that goes back to ancient cultures across the globe. There are only a handful of these places left and the ones that are still intact should not be filled in with chunks of concrete. The more we understand the history and ecology of our sacred watery places, the more likely we are to try and save them and hopefully learn the lessons they have to teach us. Today's Florida, today's brand of Florida is built on water. It's our responsibility to make sure our water is healthy for future generations because not only can water restore us to health, water is life. Thank you for the opportunity to present during this series. And again, if you can see the waterways exhibit, I recommend it highly. And I'd be glad to take any questions you got, Keith. Thanks so much, Rick, for, for I think that really fascinating talk. Um, I, I did have a couple questions as I was uh, listening that I wanted to ask you. And I wanted to remind our audience that if you also have any questions, feel free to add them in with the chat function or with the Q&A function, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, one of the things that I was just kind of interested about, and I think you, you it sort of alluded to it at the beginning of your conversation, which is that, you know, you published this book sort of at the height of, of the pandemic, which is, you know, probably really terrible timing. But what's interesting is that when it comes to, I think, talking about the healing powers of, uh, of springs, and you know, knowing that it can cure ailments and things like that. In, in your research, did you see anyone attempt to come to Florida and to go to these springs as an escape or a potential cure for something like influenza? You know, back in in sort of like post World War One, or you know, any of those types of ailments like yellow fever outbreaks or or stuff like that. Like, are people going to springs as a way to? kind of elude those or, or to get healing in, in any any capacity like that? What I've seen most um, is people with things like arthritis, you know, um, where the, it's as much about the cold water. And a lot of the ones that are state parks like DeLeon Springs and Volusia County have uh, what they call mermaids who come in before the park opens and they scrub the algae off because it gives them an opportunity to bathe in the spring every single day. And I've, I've witnessed people soaking, like in Saratoga Springs, for instance, uh, and you can tell that there, there's a huge presence of minerals in the springs, in Saratoga Springs, because the, there's this accumulation. It looks like, uh, you know, it looks like minerals. And people soak their waters there, their, their feet in the water in little tubs. I've also seen it at Eureka Springs, Arkansas, but I've not seen any people with disease. One of the, the interesting stories, though, is the only vestige of the bathing era in Green Coast Springs is this building that's a bed and breakfast, and it's right across from, from the park where the pool is, and it was originally a cottage from the Clarendon Hotel, and the lady who owns the bed and breakfast said people from Europe come to Green Cove Springs in order to bathe into the spring, the spring there, where most people in Florida really don't even know about Green Cove Springs. People in Europe still know about it as a, a place of healing and that people come all the way from Europe in order to do that. And it's only open, you know, a few months of the year, which I thought was fascinating. That is really fascinating. And uh, one of the things that I've seen as a, as a question and also in the chat, just, um, it, just sort of as a point related to the waterways exhibition, uh, in terms of, of the locations where um, it's it's going to be for this tour and that there's not one uh, in Polk County or near Lake Wales. Um, this tour is, I think, the second time that it's come to Florida, um, if not possibly the third. It's been to Florida uh, a few times. What I think is really interesting about the Waterways exhibition is that Florida was among, I believe, one of the first states to receive the exhibition uh, back when the Smithsonian first opened it. 
Um, unfortunately, the Smithsonian is planning to retire the exhibition um, at the conclusion of the Florida tour. So this specific exhibit um, on waterways, this is going to be sort of its, its curtain call, uh, so to speak, before the Smithsonian ultimately retires it at the end of, of September. Um, I think the closest location, um, Denise, for you would probably be the Citrus County Historical Society. Um, I'll link the uh, specific uh, tour schedule in the chat so you can get a look to see which one might be the closest to you, but that might ultimately be that one. Um, I think we have a question here about um, if you know the average temperature of the Northport Warm Springs, and, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Zimmer is commenting that the water at Northport seems to be warmer than others, and if you might happen to know why that's the case. Uh, I think the average temperature there is 87 degrees. Most springs in Florida are around 72, although I think Green Coast Springs is 78. And I know that Rock Springs in here in Orange County is even colder than 72. I think it's like 68. So it's like between 68 and 78 is the normal spring. Usually this, the uh, temperature of the spring is related to the depth of the water from which it comes. So I know there are multiple vents in warm springs. And so there are some actual cold water vents, as well as some hot water vents, and they mix together and produce the 87 degrees temperature. So it has to do with the depth of where the water, the aquifer is, that determines the temperature. That's, and I'm not a scientist, but that's, that's the way it was explained to me. And it's, it's the only warm or, you know, warm spring in Florida. They actually, by accident, found another one uh, down near Naples or Punta Gorda in that area. They were drilling a, just a regular well and they came across and the water was hot. So they tried to make it into kind of an attraction where the water was in a fountain in order to sell real estate. And at some point they capped it and then, you know, there's, there's houses there now, but it doesn't exist anymore. Have there been other episodes like that where someone has, has tried to create a spring and leverage um, you know, the, the popularity of that as a way to, to sort of attract tourists in, in the same sense of, you know, you think about St. Augustine and, and we have a number of locations in Florida that sort of claim to be a first landing spot for Spanish explorers um, during the 16th century. So I just wonder if that's that relatively common that someone's like, we're just going to make a spring and, and, and try to turn it into, into sort of a tourist attraction. Well, a great example is St. Augustine, the one, the spring at the Fountain of Youth, I'm fairly certain that's a well. I mean, it is now. There may have been a small spring there originally. I think it was probably always a well. The one that is there now is a well. Magnolia Springs, it's hard to tell, it, you know, that's the one right next to Green Coast Springs, if there was ever a spring there on the site, but we know there's records of them drilling wells all around the property. And there's pictures of them around this round basin. And it looks very much like a well. And I think there's a strong likelihood there never was a real spring at Magnolia Springs. There's a, a place in Enterprise called Benton Springs. Again, it looks like a well. I, I think there are a lot of instances of people just drilling a well and calling it a spring. I know a lot of the bottled water that was supposedly spring water came from wells. And then that was very common because the thing was, and is the brand of Florida water is so popular and it's all from the same aquifer. So, you know, what does it really matter whether it's coming from a pipe or, or, or coming from a natural, you know, occurrence in a spring. So I, I, I think that was fairly commonplace. And the, the other thing, part of that is um, there are a lot of springs that we don't know of anymore because they've dried up. And um, I think there was probably instances of wells that have since dried up. They were probably used as attractions. Uh, one more side of that is that real estate and springs have always gone hand in hand. You know, Deland Springs, they platted all that out and were going to build um, houses all around that in the 1920s. They, they were trying to sell land all around Silver Springs. So there's all in more mineral springs, really all that development in the 1960s was really about selling home sites. So there's always been this idea, let's draw people to the spring. And while they're here, let's sell them a lot and get them to stay and, and you know, buy the land. So. 
That's, that's interesting. And you had mentioned a second ago that uh, you said that you weren't a scientist as, as sort of a disclaimer, but it does make me wonder. I mean, in addition to, I think, history, um, what are some of the other disciplines or like research methods or anything like that that you feel like has sort of been crucial in terms of understanding, you know, springs and, and, and understanding, you know, this, this research in this, in this book that you put together? Well, the, for the science stuff, I, you know, I keep up with, uh, you know, there's, there's, since I started my original book, the amount of ink in, in popular media that springs get has exploded. You know, there's a lot of awareness of the condition of our springs. When I first started, that didn't exist, but, you, you know, the awareness is out there. And so I, you know, I've stayed involved with some of the um, scientific organizations like the Howard T. Odom Florida Springs Institute and participated in some of the seminars to know that's that side of it. The historical side of it, I, I when I was traveling talking about my first book, I would try and do research at um, some of the smaller museums and their archives around the state because they have a plethora of our information and images. And the other thing is, you know, I'm a graphic designer. I've been involved with marketing and advertising my whole life. So one of the things that I learn most from is from popular media. So old newspaper articles, old travel books, you know, you can learn a lot from some of these images because they're so detailed. You know, there's, there, there's an incredible amount of information. And then advertising, you know, because you can tell, for instance, how big an institution is by how much they're they're advertising you know how how big a facility they have and how well established it is safety harbor since it was open commercially you know really it's gone up and down but it has been consistently used by people you know as a spa from day one and it's been consistent and you know originally it was called green springs you can find all these great newspaper ads saying come to green springs and then when they do the name change, it's Safety Harbor, formerly Green Springs, you know, stuff like that. And you can learn a lot from that. It, the, the hard thing is there's one spring in my book, uh, Moncrief Springs, that really the best account is uh, in a book written by Sidney Lanier. And that's really the best evidence of it. And I, I, it's a big mystery to me, the extent of how well developed that is. You know, there's a couple of other mentions of it. But then later on, uh, there's this in incredible pioneering philanthropist named Eartha M.M. White uh, in Jacksonville. And she buys that and, and establishes a swimming pool there. And to me, that was such an important story that I, I took a, le a leap to say that there was a spa there. And I, you know, I'll never know just how big it was, but um, I hope to find out. I continue to do research. You can follow me on Facebook because I'm still looking, trying to find out more about this stuff. And I think there's more stuff out there that we haven't found yet. And I think that kind of goes to, uh, if we go back a little bit, when I asked about, you know, people coming to the Springs and stuff like that during, you know, pandemics and, and some of these ailments and stuff like that. Um, in, in your research, have you come across any uh, foreign dignitaries or, you know, like foreign royals or anyone like that who might have tried to come to Florida to, to experience those springs. I, I see it as a little bit of an extension of, you know, finding the fountain of youth, right? And, and so these potential benefits and stuff like that, it seems like if the marketing is strong, you might have some interest from, you know, just some of these really like high profile or, or sort of high society type people. So there is a rumor and I think it's unsubstantiated that the Brock House and Enterprise, that the Prince of Wales visited there. And I think it's a rumor. But we do know that one of the presidents visited there. All the big, uh, you know, we call them Robert Barron's industrialists of the age, like Jay Gould and Vanderbilt, uh, all those guys stayed there. And I, you know, Henry Ford, um, John D. Rockefeller stayed at Green Cove Springs. It was mostly Americans because one of the reasons they were coming to Florida is, you know, there was all these people with this new wealth and they really promoted, you know, um, Florida is an exotic alternative to going to Europe. So, but the Prince of Wales thing is the best instance. And 
right up the road from Enterprise is DeBerry, which was established by Frederick DeBerry, who was kind of um, connected to, to um, I guess he's German or Belgian or something like that. He was an importer of champagne and he established the Berry Hall and he had his own spring and he, and it was really a sportsman lodge, but as recreation, they had their own spring and it was, they uh, built a little pool around it made out of cypress wood. That's fascinating. So in terms of going through the process of, of writing this book, I mean, what, what did you find sort of the most rewarding component um, of, of writing the book? Um, and that could be either like in a practical sense, or maybe it's in some of the research or anything like that. And then like, what's, the, what's one of the more challenging components of, of putting this book together? Well, I love sourcing images and I, I really worked hard to try and find stuff that hadn't been published before. And, you know, the, my favorite, th you know, I wanted the quintessential cover picture, you know, of someone bathing. And when I found the image that's on the cover now on eBay, I was very happy. I traveled all the way to Lake Butler, Florida for this image they had, but they didn't in it. They own the rights to it, but they didn't have a high resolution. And um, so that was a big disappointment. But in terms of writing, I, I, I tend to have a process where I, I had a certain amount of time to write 60,000 words. And I would just do a little bit of a time at a time early in the morning instead of writing the whole thing at, at all at once. And so I would basically start in the morning on, on a spring or whatever it was and write till I just couldn't go any further. I called it writing myself into a box. And then generally I would go on to a walk afterwards and, and I, just getting away from it seemed to create space for the, for the solution where it, that would allow me to proceed the next day. And you know, that's kind of my process because I believe that if you um, you focus too much on it too hard, that what the result isn't going to be always your best creative solution. That sometimes you need to take a step back. And so every day when I was writing it, I get to a point where I couldn't push forward any any further, and I would take a step back. And by the next day, you know, I would know where I needed to go with it. And to me, that was like the big, you know, it happened every time. And it sounds like that's a really enduring process. And so I think for our last question for the evening, I think it's certainly it's something that has been asked twice. And that's certainly on the tops of minds of, of a lot of our, our viewers this evening, which is what, what are you working on next? What, what's that next project that you've either started or that you're kind of thinking towards starting? So I, I became very interested in uh, some of the stories that aren't pink flamingos and palm trees. And, you know, I, I, a theme of both of my books, in addition to water, is really Florida tourism. And I'm very interested in the image portrayed by the state of Florida and the truth, the reality behind that. Because there are stories in Florida, and this is a very timely topic right now, that, um, you know, don't fit the image that the state wants portrayed and that those are downplayed throughout tourism promotion throughout history. So I, you know, I'm still, it's still very mushy right now, but I want to kind of contrast the image put out by the state and the state started the uh, Bureau of Immigration. It was actually part of the Department of Agriculture in the 1880s or 1870s or 1880s to bring people to Florida. And they, you know, so first it would be like you'd see, you know, invalids, tourism, settlers, and then they would start adding farmers and they'd talk about the crops and the salubrious waters, and then they would add tourism stuff. But they said, started going down a path to kind of portray the state in a certain way, but really that's not the whole story of, of the state of Florida. So I want to, you know, I the one way I think about it in my mind is like, um, you know, here's this image from the state tourism propaganda, and here's the reality of, of the state. So I'm still kind of kicking that around. I'm not sure how that will look or, or if I'll even follow through with that. I have, you know, I get ideas all the time. It, you know, you gotta go where the juice is. And right now that still has a lot of juice, but I, I decided I needed to take a step back 
because I was getting a little obsessed with it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's certainly that obsession that can sometimes drive us to, to wanting to do those types of projects. And so uh, for people that are interested in getting the most up-to-date information and wanting to follow you, what's the best place to do that? Facebook for sure, finding the fountain of youth, or I think it's Florida Healing Waters. Either put either one of those in um, the Facebook search bar, and you'll find it. I'm old FLA on Twitter. If you want to follow me on Twitter, but I try and do a Facebook post every day that's related. You know, I'm still searching for new images and different ways to tell the story. And you know, what I love is when I find a new image early in the morning and then fall down the rabbit hole do a little research and learn something new in it, I'm able to share it that morning on, on Facebook. Uh, because I still think, like I said, there's there's more to learn about this topic. And I think we're absolutely looking forward to learning more about the topic specifically on Springs and then whatever you wind up doing next. So thank you, Rick, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And thank you to our audience that joined us as well. Again, you're going to receive a survey. And so we'd appreciate you taking the time to fill it out for us. Uh, in addition to that, we have our final program in this special series on water taking place tomorrow evening, June 25th. That's with Cynthia Barnett, who's going to talk about state of water, state of mind as uh, a summation, not only of all the talks that we've done this week, but also celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. Uh, which is occurring this year. So hopefully we'll be able to see you for that program. And if not, we hope to see you at another uh, future program again sometime soon. So thanks so much and have a fantastic evening. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.